So what we're going to talk about today is a very practical genomic medicine, by which I mean not any stuff that we think is going to be imminent in two years, but what it means today to do genomic medicine. Nothing in the future, just today. And if you think that I have stepped across the line into the future, call me on it. So let's talk about diffusions of knowledge. The genome draft, as you know, was uh, much heralded with uh, Clinton. Was Clinton still president in 2001? No. So it was before. When was the draft the first? Uh, uh, when was Venter, Venter and, um, and Collins and Clinton? Wasn't it Clinton? Yeah, it was Clinton. It was 2000. So that's an error. Uh, so it was much heralded, and there was a lot of promise about this would solve problems in human disease and in medicine, and it made it sound, the way it was described, it was fairly imminent, and it was going to transform medicine. And just as a measure of calibration, the development of penicillin by Chain and uh, Flory in 41 was saving thousands of lives within months. And so has genomic medicine been successful by that measure? No. Do we think it's going to impact um, medicine in the future? Well, sure. I think I, I hope I've convinced you that in the course of the class that it's going to be important in the way we diagnose our patients, in the way we manage our patients, even the way we treat our patients. But clearly not by this measure, and I think we have to all appreciate that probably the time scales are on the order of uh, 10 to 20 years, and uh, in fact, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, uh, one of my friends, was, uh, used to be a reporter for uh, the New York Times when this was announced in 2000, asked me, so what's going to be the main impact of the, uh, of the um, human genome draft for the next 10 years? I said, a lot of bad news, and that, what, by which I meant that we're probably going to be able to diagnose a lot of things that we had not been able to diagnose and do nothing about it. And that's probably why not, but there's another reason why not which is, um, well, why do you think there's, what other problems have there been in preventing the diffusion of genomic medicine? Any ideas? Massive amounts of data. What? <laughs> Massive amounts of data. Massive amounts of data and? Lack of trained personnel. And lack of trained personnel. Basically, the medical system does not um, have any idea how to deal with this. And just to give you some uh, calibration around that, I gave a, a lecture um, a year ago to the American professors of medical genetics, not genomics, but medical genetics. And I was telling them about the whole genomics revolution. And you might think it's an odd thing for me to talk to professors of medical genetics in the National Association. But they were, they, they were polite and interested in my lecture. But when I asked them, is this what you see yourself doing for the next uh, 20 years? Absolutely not. They wanted to restrict themselves to monogenic, strongly, pen highly penetrant uh, diseases uh, that were extremely rare. That's what they want to do. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, you share at least a substring with the genomics. Uh, don't you see this part of your field? No. And um, so the geneticists are not uh, holding the torch. Right now, the medical students are not being uh, taught this in any detail whatsoever. And so there's, there's going to be a problem. So who? is going to practice genomic medicine. There's a variety of uh, possibilities. Shown in um, white blue for some reason is the medical geneticist, the person who, who typically has been doing, yeah, sorry about that, <laughs> uh, who, has, who has typically, that'll be the last light blue um, thing, I hope, uh, who's been doing medical diagnosis and counseling. But what I'm telling you is they do not see themselves as uh, bring to four, into the fore the entirety of the impact of uh, genetics into um, the broad swath of diseases, whether they're primarily inherited or primarily um, modifying um, environmental influences. A logical place would be primary care, because after all, as I hope I've convinced you, if indeed part of what Genobus gives you is the ability to prognosticate for the future, part of preventive care should be gen uh, genetic uh, and genome-wide uh, testing. So a pediatrician and internist to uh, OBGYN would be a natural place for this to, to happen. And also for specific diseases, 
we've seen a lot of application of microarrays for to cancer, for instance. So oncologist would be a natural um, um, person to order these tests. And a gastroenterologist, we looked at uh, Crohn's disease, and it'd be not it'd be logical for a gastroenterologist to screen for risk factors. So what's in fact the case? So there was a study done just looking at cancer susceptibility tests. So it's a fairly substantial study looking at the over uh, 1,200 physicians, 820 of which were in primary care. And in 12 months, approximately 30% ordered or referred uh, genetic uh, testing, looking for susceptibility. Not looking for diagnosing a patient, but for looking were they at risk. So that's kind of impressive. It, it's a little bit less impressive that only 7% of them directly did it, whether because they were uncomfortable or not knowledgeable enough to actually directly order it. But that's telling you that 30% of this random sample of physicians were actually ordering these uh, susceptibility tests. What do you imagine are the factors uh, um, affecting ordering? Let me give you some, um, some potential, what were you saying? Cost. Any other suggestions? What, whether you can interpret the test. Any other suggestions? It's not what? Which, what? which physicians were more likely? No, no. What I meant was which physicians were more likely to order tests. I apologize for it. Let me rephrase the question. What was it about them? What property of the physicians made them much more likely to? Research hospitals? So places where they had a high burden of uh, genetically um, disease. Well, here's the answer. The first and foremost was it being in the Northeast. I don't know what it means, but that's in fact it was a by far. So there's plenty of uh, wonderful tertiary care centers on, on the West Coast. I hear, um, but that was not a uh, a telling thing. Feeling competent, as you mentioned, um, the presence of advertising materials, and most importantly, having the patient ask for it. The point here is that the reason there was such a high um, percentage, 30%, is not because doctors have been trained to order those tests. It's because the patients are reading um, the lay literature, and if they have breast cancer in, in the family, or they have ovarian cancer, or they have um, colon cancer, they're asking the doctors to test them. That's, that's, that's the, uh, the real insight. Let me just answer this. Hi. Hi, I'm teaching a class. Can I call you back? Go ahead. Um, when you say cancer, you know, it's just really presumably some kind of multiplex PCR looking at different alleles. Or is it actually a genomic test, like an array? Or? It will, it, it's a multiplex test, not a, okay. a, not an array test. And then the, the question about Northeast, is it just simply medical professional density? Is no, this is corrected for it. It's, for, yeah. it's the New York Times or anything mm -hmm. it, it, It's something else. It's, 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 it's corrected for it. It's something about the um, nature of the training, or maybe patients in the Northeast. Maybe, let's put it this way, maybe there's a lot of Ashkenazi Jewish women worried about breast cancer knowing that they have this BRCA1, BRCA2 risk factor. That, the article did not um, actually elaborate on that, but that's my guess. I think the patients are the driving factor. And for those of us who are in medicine, um, I think we have to recognize this. And it's actually a sad fact that it's the patients who are driving it. But it's a problem because um, if one of the things that you bring to to uh, bear as a doctor is an appreciation of prior probability and what is what tests you want to do in order to avoid false positives. Because remember, a lot of these polymorphisms or uh, mutations may not actually be the causative um, element. They may be in linkage disequilibrium, for instance. And so it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not if you have this you're going to have cancer. It's a, it's a probabilistic measure. And so there is going to be a, a false positive rate with any of these uh, measures. And if the doctor is really not knowledgeable about that interpretation, uh, then 
they're going to find problems. Just as if doctors did routine uh, CT scans on everybody, you'd find on the order of um, people my age, maybe 10 to 20 percent pituitary uh, microadenomas, as we, as we find when we do um, aut autopsies of uh, car accidents in people my age. But they have no clinical meaning that we can tell. But if you do routine testing, you'll find that. And this is going to be a, create a huge problem of false positives if we continue to have patient-driven demand for testing because it should be done knowledgeably. Or would that cannot be um, met with, like, so when a, if a doctor orders this or has, you know, refers them to a specialist and they order it, um, when these tests come back, uh, I'm assuming they don't, I mean, it's probably wrong, but they don't come back the way, like, a normal blood test is, you know, like, with just certain numbers and whatever the doctor's, you know, like, the, you know, blood tests. Like the, the short answer is, Theoretically, not. So that that well, no, there's actually has to be personal. We'll get we'll get to that. But even so, if you have a, an ascertainment bias because of who's doing it, without actually um, letting the medical system try to define a uh, appropriate uh, measure of when you do a test, then you you you're going to run into those problems more than less. Oh, so you're suggesting that maybe. So patients are asking for particular tests because they're worried. They're worried. So, and you're suggesting that maybe that's a bad thing, well, not because the doctor should be the ones to, just, to, to say, hey, you might want to think about this, but you're saying that it's uh, maybe they... It's, it's, it's a self-selected group, and it may be that the people who are truly at risk are, are not getting tested. Basically, the doctor is not, is not a decision maker here, and the whole role of a doctor is to decide, if anything, when is a test going to be cost effective and sufficiently uh, useful for the patient? And if they disintermediate themselves and allow the patient to do that, then there's a risk that there's a group of people who won't be screened and a group of people who are being overscreened and therefore have an unacceptably high false positive rate. Because basically, when people come up with calculations of um, uh, sensitivity and specificity, they do it based on a certain population of patients. When a genetic counselor says you have X, Y, percent risk based on a general population. They don't base it on the, uh, the group of patients who are neurotic and worried, maybe appropriately, about uh, their family history. Maybe that might be a different set of specificity and sensitivities. I'm not saying that patients are wrong to be worried. What I'm saying is the, the medical system is failing. They don't have educated doctors who they can intermediate, intermediate about what is the appropriate testing to be done. I mean, if, if a patient comes to me as an endocrinologist and says, I want growth hormone testing, I know not to do growth hormone testing on everybody asked because there's a significant false positive rate and we end up treating a whole bunch of people uh, with growth hormone for no reason. That, that, that's the, and that's the whole point of having uh, an expert as part of their loop. And uh, what I'm saying is this is telling us that there's a demand and the medical system is failing. So here's the conventional view of genetic information ma management. It's worth going through it. They, you can think of disorders being single gene or chromosomal, major gene multifactorial, or these complex traits, complex multifactorial. And the conventional view of how this should be used is, in primary care, the point would be to recognize signs and symptoms, make referrals, support family longitudinal care, the primary care should appreciate the role of family history, arrange testing and referral to specialists as needed, provide longitudinal care. And for complex uh, traits, use of genetic tests to guide prevention and treatment, the specialist would manage specific problems. They would uh, diagnose and manage uh, system-specific problems, and they'd use also genetic tests to guide, uh, prevent, and treat. And the medical geneticist, the role there is counseling, longitudinal care, advice on interpretation of test results, uh, and um, a reservoir of knowledge of handling of complex uh, cases. But I just told you that the medical geneticists have largely not met this role. So is there a different role? What to do? Is there a, med is there a medical genomicist? What do you think? Is that a reasonable specialty, or is that the wrong answer? Someone, would you, if you were, if you wanted a good preventive care, and you wanted someone who would give you appropriate counseling about either lifestyle changes or 
appropriate uh, drugs that you need to consider or uh, specific for the diagnostic test that you have to do for all possible genetically influenced diseases, what kind of person would you, would you want to go to? Any ideas? So your first reaction is primary care. Let's um, does do primary care practitioners currently know about any of this stuff? No. So it's primary with someone we give them a very simple explanation. So you know, someone else is testing gives them sort of what it means, and they can tell you what it means, and then manage that in your whole. So let's 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 do this slowly with feeling because you're now the czar of medicine, in in um, and or you're trying to start a company in, um, in this area in the United States in 2004. Who's going to actually do this job? Well, I mean, I tell you, I, I, I think the idea of going to any one single person, whether it's specialist, genomicist, geneticist, or primary care, I think is the wrong approach. I don't think any one person um, just in, the, in their specific roles can address, especially as you move down that uh, that leftmost column to the, you know, the very complex disease. I think that's the... So what do you do? Well... We have a bunch of patients. We know that there's a large number of people who are going to die of complications of type 2 diabetes, and it's exploding. We know there's a, a large cancer burden. We know there's a large cardiovascular disease burden. How are, and we know that some component of all the diseases is, compl is, is in fact down at the bottom. So what are we going to do? So I think rather than having a medical genomicist, it would be nice to have a, uh, a type of physician who organized uh, the different levels of care into like a team-based approach to be able to, hey, what? a team-based approach so to, to address it. So you have like the traditional uh, and, you know, and maybe a, the genomicist would be appropriate for handling the genetic aspects in, you know, in collaboration. But you have somebody who is seeing the patient outside of the regular PCP, right? Mm -hmm. um, who can, you know, who can integrate sort of the latest technologies along with the traditional therapies and it, it communicate across. So basically, a, a, a Someone who's a generalist in medicine, but a specialist about inherited diseases and complex diseases, and also a team, uh, a, a, a team communicator coordinator. Right. So that for each patient, you've got one person um, who's you know not having to worry about the occasional sniffle here or that, like the PCV, but also is focused on a bigger picture than maybe the specialist or the or the geneticist. Go ahead. I think it's unrealistic to have a team. Like, I wish I had a team of specialists around me all the time, like, doing stuff for me. I think it's, you know, the reality is you're going to have, at most, one person who knows anything about your health on any kind of ongoing basis. And that person should be the your counselor to let you know things about lifestyle, things about, you know, preventive care. And they should have information, the genomic information to help give you advice about your particular lifestyle decision you should make. And that should be the primary care physician. So I think that it's, it's going to be really hard to have like a lot of people around these specialists, like genomicists, giving you this sort of preventive care type of information because they don't know you that well. So you see the primary care practitioner, Cecily. I mean, you know, as more and more of these genomic tests come online, like looking at cancer and microarrays, you're, you're just going to you're going to need people who know about the techniques, who know about the methods, and who can help help the physicians interpret it. I mean, there's going to be a, a role for them. They're going to be you know, we're seeing already there's going to be an explosion of, you know, SNPs and, you know, pharmacogenomics and all this stuff. And you're, you're going to need to have people who know the techniques who can help the primary care. And yet, and, and I think we're, and yet, so that's, the, so there's, I think, tr they're absolutely true what you both said. On one hand, it's unlikely that we'd, we'll have swarms of people uh, worrying about us, and yet, um, there is going to be this explosion, and no one person. I mean, it's already pretty hard to be a good primary care practitioner with knowledge circa 1990. How are they going to do that? Any ideas? How are we going to? So, so you have operationalized what you were suggesting. Can you? I mean, that, that you might you might have in, in a hospital, medical genomics, you know, 
illnesses that, that these primary care physicians can, you know, call up or refer a patient to to help interpret and make these. But if it's part of primary care, but what if it's part of primary care? So everybody, I mean, we're all going to, unfortunately, unless one of us is a major messianic figure, going to die um, um, for one disease or other. So we're at risk and probably, um, and hopefully will not be um, a bus hitting us. So it's going to be something that's going to become uh, interaction between the environment and our genes. So who's going to know? Uh, so that's for all of us. So basically we need that information, unless we don't want that information. For every one of us, so who, so just it's not going to be, um, hey, um, I have an interesting problem. It's part of routine care, I think. Everybody needs to be. There could be a, like a department of genomics and that, but that's an, that's an, the academic answer. I'm talking about the process in the field. Who's going to be the guy or girl who's going to be providing that knowledge, either as a primary care practitioner or to the primary care practitioner. So here's some ideas I had. You know, your ideas, by the way, are as good as, as, as mine. And I want to tell you, this is actually the central. I mean, this course is about genomic medicine. And I think this is a central conundrum. How, there is no plan right now how to bring all of this into, um, into the field. And I can tell you in pediatric endocrinology, we're, we're not even ordering the um, autosomal dominant, well understood, highly penetrant single genes that we know about because of the educational problems, let alone all these other um, complex diseases. So any idea that you have could be of great interest to our system or to a company if you could actually figure out how to do this right. It's definitely going to be market driven. You know, I mean, right now it's a lot of research and then when the really good tests and the really good results come online and generate high profile papers, then, then the, the, the you know, patients that are going to start demanding these things. And yeah, but that's the problem. For instance, prostate specific antigen um, done wrongly gets a whole poor, poor guys get their prostates removed for nothing. Um, False uh, you know, positive. positive. Yeah, and so that's the problem. Uh, and and as I explained to you uh, in my first lecture, there's 7,000 articles just on the appropriate use of the prostate-specific antigen. We have now 30,000 genes to worry about, and what you know, what are the right cutoffs? And let's be optimistic and say we can actually get the optimal answers for these. No one individual I can think can, can um, actually solve it. So you're absolutely right. It will be market driven. That's certainly true. But the question is, how will the market solve that problem? And I'm claiming there are companies out there that will solve that. And either it will be inspired us by ideas similar to ones we're going to articulate today or by other ideas. So all I'm calling for is thought about this. So one was, Internet-enabled triage specialists. Basically, you feed your genome to essentially a service on the internet, and they take whatever the primary care physician says, and they basically, you know, in India or somewhere else, um, um, provide uh, provide you with your risk profile, the next steps for you to take. That's one possibility. So you check each patient at the door for inheritable genetic or epigenetic phenomenon. A parallel system. That's um, um, essentially a fly on the wall during a mental interview, provide decision supports. And this could be a person, or more likely, a computer program. But it's going to have to be a damn good computer program to be able to do that. But you know, I was involved in knowledge representation, knowledge-based systems in the 80s when I was doing my thesis. Um, but there really wasn't any good motivation for it, because in the end, Doctors know how to um, uh, diagnose acid base problems. But doctors will never be, able, never be able to do this. So this is a true motivation, I believe, for automated decision support. The, the alternative is just to redo the curriculum in a major way, and even so, to teach students how to use the electronic resources in uh, near real time. I see no, because no one's going to be able to keep this in their head. The 
last one, I think, would require such simplification of like outputs that you, you know, in terms of like, feeding a genome in and spitting out money. Right, but it would not be a number. The way for um, when I was talking about um, spitting out when you feed in the genome and signs, I, the answer would not be, you know, these are the levels of your various things. It would be, you have a 30% increased risk for prostate cancer. Uh, the following test is the right thing to do. That kind of thing, because no, again, no primary care physician can know. As I said, barely knows how to. No, almost none of them uh, no, know fully all the literature in prostate-specific antigen uh, screening for prostate uh, cancer, and let alone for 30,000 tests. So I think the, it would have to be a distilled, utility-based, sensitivity-specificity-based. That's, that's what I mean. Like, you know, they, get a, they get a sheet back right. from the lab they get it from, or from the... Oh, it would be, it'd be some flight in that sense. Absolutely. I think that's the, that is the only way. Uh, you know, endocrinologists have made a big career out of just in interpreting uh, three numbers, uh, TSH, uh, TBGI, and T4 in the thyroid test. Because guess what? Most medical students can never figure out which way it means hyperthyroid, hypothyroid, or, or changes in the amount of binding uh, protein. They just... Doesn't, doesn't that then relegate the medical genomics to just the category of specialists once again? Well, they, they have to know the lack of a specific disease, which is a specialist. No, well, I don't... You see, I'm, I'm claiming that the, the system um, cannot um, have a expert me medical geneticist. That since we are, since a lot of what we were talking about is primary care, it's prevention. This has to be in every primary care situation. So it's either outsourced essentially to the internet, uh, to some other group of people, have a low-cost parallel assistant, whether it's a human or more likely a computer program. And the third is just redoing education. So um, to, to your scenario, which I think is a good, uh, one of the good ones, which is to have a very simplified set of recommendations come to the primary care physician. It's the primary care physician still who just has to learn how to look intelligently at that report, that set of recommendations. I don't see them having to learn the, you know, the 30,000 genes and all the epigenetic and genetic effects. That does not seem reasonable. But this is the fundamental problem that we have in, in genomic medicine. And that's, this is going to be by far the rate limiting step for any penetration to, the, to uh, managing human disease than any, any other aspect of um, the genomic enterprise. We're going to discover lots of interesting things. We're going to we're going to uh, find good drugs. We're going to make interesting diagnoses. But translating it into cares would be uh, the real challenge. So how are we going to pay for those roles? Extremely unclear. Right now, you can't get a lot of genetic tests paid for. So. I, I don't know why is that? Just because it hasn't developed enough in terms of Right. With the result, and finally, because it's very expensive and it became free, everybody would use it. I mean, right now, as I told you at the beginning of the first lecture, in the high throughput lab, it costs um, 10 cents to, to do a genotype. Do you know how much it costs to actually, how much the, the system is billed for for that test? So the, I was telling you the first like 10 cents in order to tell you, wow, the genomic future is now. We can do very cheap screening. But how much are we, uh, is our insurance system being billed for for these tests, for that single genotype? Over $1,000. And that's just that, I mean, that's the thing that I think. Yeah. But if there's a, I mean, there's. No, I mean, that, no, it, that's not the real cost. That's, that's a huge profit margin. Right. There's a similar debate going on with these like full body MRI scans and things. Right? Sure. Like, and so, that, I mean, where are the voices in the field for like this and for those saying you know, preventatively, if we do, you know, if we, a whole battery of non invasive, you know, one day tests, you, know, you submit a sample, you know, that, that you can do your uh, genomic testing, you sit in the MRI, you do other stuff. And then, hey, we found this particular disease, and we just saved sixty, seventy, maybe hundred thousand dollars worth of treatment. Well, that's not way. First of all, that's not way the system sees it. The system sees that you just spent um, 
four thousand bucks, and my insurance my my insurance company is going to reward me for what I have to do in the next two three years. If you you know drop dead of cancer ten years from now, the that's going to be uh, the balance on the insurance company for ten years from now. There's not a lot of payback to me. But more importantly, speaking as a clinician, I think these total body MRIs are terrible because you're finding a lot of incidental findings. In fact, if the medical establishment is against those, I think, for good reason. Because, again, it's um, the, the, the probabilities that we have around the meaning of um, bumps on the MRI is around people presenting with certain symptoms. Because these studies are around that. And if you just have Joe Blow off the street who just has a birthday present, a full body MRI scan, uh, which, by the way, didn't that, haven't you heard the advertisements for it? No, it's, it's your, yeah, it's your 40th, 40th birthday, or uh, don't you want to do this, or your dad's birthday, don't you? And they talk about the, uh, some, you know, the ad advertisement is, uh, uh, Joe Blow, the patient, reports, oh, I was so reassured on my 40th birthday, I see nothing's wrong with me. What they don't report on is the, the old people who got bumps in their head and then had to go to crani craniotomy, God knows what, to uh, investigate uh, these things. So I promise you that we want to, that we're going to st stick to the pragmatics. So this is why there's not penetration today. But today, how how do you order a test, um, a genetic test for a clinical problem? What do you do? How, how do you order it? Well, yeah. What do you do? Um, you go to geneclinics.org and check which lab uh, has it, and then whether it's a research lab or a CLIA. Does everybody do you hear, hear that? That's very, very important. Gene clinics and gene test. Don't argue. It, it's one of the things you better uh, stick to you after this class because that there are thousands of clinics and labs across the United States that have one or two tests. There's no single giant aggregator of genetic tests. And this is one website maintained by my colleague Peter Tarzi Harlock at the University of Washington uh, that has all that. So that's exactly right. I mean, just a question in terms of market stuff. Do you think that's going to eventually roll onto the quests and the? Uh, 100%. So let me, let me, let, that's an excellent question. And so let me, um, um, let me, okay, let me just get to that question in, in uh, two minutes. So this is, um, for the, this is, I'm sorry, it's an old slide. It's a year old slide. And they had, on gene clinics, gene tests, 189 gene reviews, which are very nice monographs around the specific disease, involving a thousand different uh, clinics and 500 laboratories, covering 948 uh, diseases. And um, the short answer is yes. These are going to be rolled up into um, the quests and the various laboratory corporations. The real question is. Ultimately, we know what it's going to look like. It's going to be a highly roboticized um, um, sequencing genotyping operation in these, in these labs. But in, in, the, in, the, in the interim, it may still be that it's rolled up, but the actual sequencing and procedures might still be at these various places, and these companies might just uh, co uh, contract to these various sources. Right now, for instance, if you want to do Duchenne's testing, your sample goes to a place in Utah. Now, why is that? Bec uh, why not just roll it into one place? Because the guys that the, the, who, are, who are resequencing the Duchenne's gene for uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy know which primers, uh, AKA, which sequence work the best to amplify different segments of the gene to get reliable results. And that know-how ultimately can be definitely rolled up. But in the interim, on the five to, you know, on the five-year time scale, may or may not be just left locally, and so. Th what the labs will, what these requests will be, are more aggregators and front ends, conduits um, or channels, as the marketers like to say, to these myriad labs. Ultimately, I think everybody believes it'll be in one highly roboticized facility in each one of these um, uh, facilities, because after all, a gene is a gene is a gene. But because of the things like um, knowledge of what primers work, knowledge of which mutations are common and what they mean, all that knowledge management is still distributed. And rolling it up is going to be, uh, I think, uh, the, the uh, break on that uh, full roll up. So it, for those of you who don't know the site, so if you want to test for a particular problem, you, uh, you can look at uh, this thing. And you say, I want to look at obesity. And I'll tell you 
which laboratory will do which um, testing for, in fact, probably the only uh, BC related gene worth testing for right now is MC4R. It's the most common genetically associated cause of um, obesity. MC4R is a melanocort uh, corticotropin uh, receptor, the f fourth uh, type, and um, some high percentage on the order of 2% of individuals uh, with, um, according to some studies, with uh, morbid obesity have uh, mutations here. Unfortunately, for those, the rest of us, um, like me, um, we're just fat because we eat wrong. So we're talking about, go ahead. Yeah. But is this indexing that gene clinics and gene tests are generally sufficient? So if you look at congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or adre sorry, adrenal hyperplasia, which is a disease um, of children and adulthood. It's responsible for ambiguous, gen uh, ambiguous genitalia in infants, hirsutism and infertility in females, and uh, precocious puberty for, for uh, males and females. So if you look for um, adrenal hyperplasia, you see the following. You get 21 hydroxylase deficiency. But what's the right thing to actually order? Well, if you actually knew something about the pathway, the the um, steroidogenesis pathway, you'd know that it starts from cholesterol. The cholesterol that we all uh, claim to hate actually is the backbone from all the steroid hormone molecules. Cholesterol will make all the um, salt-retaining hormones like aldosterone, the uh, glucose-stimulating uh, hormones like cortisol, and the sex hormones like testosterone and estradiol. And an appreciation of what the pathways are is going to allow you to actually do focused testing. So that, for instance, 21 hydroxylase deficiency is in fact the most common, but there are other deficiencies that happen with some regularity, like 5% of uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is 11 hydroxylase deficiency and not 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And the bars here just show um, the, the block in the pathway that would be caused by the deficiency of that gene. And so the point is, you still need a lot of knowledge around that specific disease in the pathways rather than just going up to a, a database that says obesity, this gene. You still have to have some knowledge about what you're looking for. So what material do you want to test? Let's take four diseases. Cystic fibrosis, a disease uh, where you get plugging of mucosal ducts and it's a, it's a chloride transporter problem and people die young. McCune Albright disease, a disease of uh, the, uh, the, G, uh, com the G protein uh, complex, where um, essentially you have an activating mutation in one of the subunits so that you have a lot of the G coupled uh, processes are hyperactive, so that you have kids with precocious puberty, cortical adenomas of the adrenal, and uh, precocious puberty. Or, well, McCune Albright syndrome, the, the, the classical description is cafe au lait spots. Cafe au lait spots, which are these, basically looks like someone spilled coffee on your, on your skin. Um, um, fibrous dysplasia of the bones, so your bones are screwed around because they have these sort of um, ropey things going through them. And precocious puberty. It's distantly. And but as we learn more about it, multiple systems like thyroid and growth hormone can also be hyperstimulated. So basically it's a uh, mosaic state where multiple, where these mutations can actually be spread incompletely throughout the body. And so for instance, the melanocytes are stimulated in just patches. And if you're unlucky enough to have adrenal involved, then you get adrenal adenoma. So, Please. Uh, can I get a scenario for, like, what so a patient comes to you with McCune Albright syndrome, and you suspect it because Zach told me that they have these cafe spots. Boy, this person has uh, two big ones, uh, and this person is having a precocious puberty, and is complaining of bone pain. What do I send to test? That's the question. So, 
But whereas with the first one, cystic fibrosis, they would have pretty much know that they had well, you, you, you suspect that they did a, you did a sweat test, which has a certain uh, specificity, specificity, um, specificity and uh, uh, sensitivity. Or let's make, or maybe it's a parent who already had a kid who died from stick fibrosis, and they, and they just have a newborn. What are you going to, what are you going to test? No, you don't know the end thing yet. So let's, let's do one at a time. Cystic fibrosis. A testing gene, but I'm I'm a I'm a stupid doctor. Indeed, I am. What does it mean to test gene? What thing do I stick into a tube? Oh, uh, just a mucosal swab. So for stick, I can do a mucosal swab. The short answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> what? No. Mucinal bright. What if you, you get a piece of, you know, a, you know, a bit of, maybe the cells here are not involved. Maybe it's not. Maybe you get a, a, a skin biopsy of, of the cathelio spot. 21 hydroxy is efficiently germline. You can do the blood. Classified cancer, blood is not the right answer. You need a hunk of that cancer. Or, depends. Is it a highly inherited cancer, or do you believe it's a, a somatic mutation in the cancer? All the point I'm making here is it's not obvious what you put into the tube. And that, as dumb as it sounds, when you're a tired resident on the ward and someone says, do the genetic test, you don't know what the hell to, to do. This, it, it's that simple. But, and this is a, but this is what it comes down to genetic medicine. You have, these are actually answerable questions, but you need some reading. You know, where are the mutations, and what, where do I, you know, and what do they mean when they are in certain tissues? So for diseases, So you're saying for germline diseases, uh, for, germ, uh, for a germline disease, you can, any tissue doesn't matter, so you want one that is the least invasive, blood, swab, even spit sometimes. But for some other complex diseases where people suspect that you have susceptibility, which then triggers the disease. Now most people, to our knowledge, well, it's going to be certainly not true for many diseases, but for instance, when, when Scott Weiss talks about asthma, He's thinking of a risk factor, even if it's a small risk factor, you know, increase your risk of asthma by 1.2. He's still thinking of this as a germline, uh, a germ, germline polymorphism. Now, it may be that there's that people with asthma. I'm just making up something that's completely off the off the beaten path. Is in fact a somatic mutation. I doubt it. But all these genotyping studies, haplotype studies, are done off of blood, so they're assuming it. These are germline diseases. So for something that's not. Germline, yeah. Something that maybe you've, you've got a disease because you're exposed to some sort of right. environmental toxin or something. Like that. Or you have a somatic mutation. Yeah. 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 Um, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be a good standard protocol then to take, uh, like, let's say for the cancer, take, right. take you know, part of the tumor and part of just any other tissue to compare or to blood? The sure. or something like that to, to be able to. I mean, the, the, the short answer is cost, but yes. I mean, the answer is. Well, I mean, wasn't it Weiss who said that in, in the next five years, this cost thing is not going to be an issue? Because well, it's not going to be an issue for him doing research. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, you know, what I just told you is, you know, 10 cents a genotype today um, for Scott Weiss, for you, my friend, $1,000 in, in the clinic. And that's, uh, by the way, that's a huge op commercial opportunity, obviously. That, you're absolutely right, that's going to drop. It's not going to drop to 10 cents. It's going to drop to $10 or $100. And the market leaders in that who can actually figure out how to make the bucks on this at that level are going to be extremely rich. So, but, and then you need to have, okay, so if you ordered a test, you're going to need to get advice on that genetic test. Where are you going to get that? You can found either in your office. Let me tell you, off of that, extremely unlikely. There's no one in my office who's going to give you uh, genetic counseling. Or other licensed counselors, maybe as part of your institution. I'm talking about today. We're not talking about the medical genomes. I, mean, I promise you, today, what are you going to do? Or licensed con counselors at the Brigham, or you outsource it. And here, you know, it says there's a pretest email phone consultation provided patients and so on. And that might be part of the business model that uh, they understand that a lot of institutions don't have that um, that facility, so they can outsource it. So how do you send a store for sending? Again, these are stupid things that m most residents don't know. 310 milliliters of whole blood, if it's a germline, in a purple top tube, 
also acceptable green, uh, green, which is sodium heparin, or light blue, sodium citrate uh, tubes. You know, in the, in the, it comes down to that. What tube do you put it in? If you put it in the wrong tube, you, you may not have a, a adequate, adequate extraction. And it's totally different, of course, for RNA. If you're interested in RNA, you better uh, flash freeze it as a short answer as soon as you can. So what kind of DNA? Why just the two DNA? Because basically, the amount of, the, the, amount of uh, the stability and the extractability is going is to depend on what is inside the tube. And the color of the tube tells is the code of what's inside the tube. So these tubes are not all uh, featureless glass. They have a little bit of chemical in them. So what kind of DNA testing should be done? So let me ask you guys. We've just uh, got together in a happy company called 512 Genomic Testing. We've uh, got our stock options. And um, what are we going to do? Are we going to sequence these genes? When someone sends us a gene to 512 Genomics, are we going to sequence it? Let's say, or are we going to genotype it for all the known mutations? What are we going to do? So let me, okay, Jose, let me push you. So just arrived in our uh, inbox is a, is a blood sample in the right tube from Jill Schmo, who just, uh, from Jill Schmo, but it's really her baby's blood. And she wants to know, does this baby have 21 hydroxylase uh, deficiency? And they heard that 512 uh, Genomics is a very smart company because they've been trained at Harvard Medical School. And therefore, uh, they trust us to do it. So you can do a panel of what? Genes? Uh, let's, let's say 21. Uh, let's simplify your life. I'm not going to, well, first of all, are we going to test all genes? Uh, no, before you start testing the genes that, that are known to. That are known and that are frequent. Okay, I want us to have a very nice um, corporate vacation in Bermuda. So all the money that we spend is going to um, uh, take away from the, the bennies I can give you in our, on, our, on our vacation. So uh, we're going to do, okay, we're going to do, I'm going to tell you there's five genes that are, that are called. So we're going to do all five genes? Uh, no, then, then you look, um, you, you look at the frequency of a particular mutation occurring. Okay, so I'm going to tell you there's two genes that account for 99%. Good enough for us? Okay, let's say yes. Let's say yes. Well, why can't we just do one gene that comes back negative? If we know two is two comprised 99%, why can't we do the one that comes back negative? If we do it, but it comes back positive, say, hey, we got this, this particular. We're going to go back to the patient? Um, that, that doesn't happen. We're, 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 we're a lab. That doesn't, we're not the doctor. That does not happen. We, can, we, have no, we're, we cannot ask. We, unless you really want to change, you live in, in the dream world. No, no, I'm just saying, you, so you, no, no, you can't go back to the patient and say, get the blood, right? But, You'll first sequence, the, you know, I mean, just first sequence the more common gene. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so if you've got two genes, I guess that... Okay, so uh, let me tell you, let's the facts. 21 hydroxylase accounts for 95%. 11 hydroxylase, uh, 4%. So we've got 99% with those two genes. So what, what am I actually doing? I'm not a laboratory technician. Yeah, do the 95%. Okay, and, and it's it's negative. negative. What do you, what do I do now? Then you do the then you do the next one. Because we're positive, right? Then you then I, I don't know enough about the disease, so you know, assuming that, that a positive The positive is important. Positive is very important. So that then you just stay running that that extra test. Okay, so you're doing a phase a phase one. That's perfectly acceptable. But it probably means that most of the time we'll run to both tests. Because most of the time We'll probably get referrals of patients who don't have that disease. So it's a small but important incremental savings you just gave us. You took Jose's advice and say let's only took let's only do one of the gene, and if that's negative, we'll do the second gene. But as I just explained, most kids that are sent this, sent, this was sent for will in fact not have the disease because there'll be something else. And um, we'll still have to do the second one. You had a question. My question is, this is a PCR-based test, right, just to clarify? So well, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, okay. 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 So let's say that we take the modification of the Jose protocol. So what are we going to do? So we're going to look at one gene and then two genes. So w what actually are we going to measure? Are we going to measure um, the full sequence of these genes? Are we going to um, just look at the known published mutations or SNPs? What are we going to do? Now, 
what if I tell you that two thirds of the mutations are extremely common and one third of them are one of a kind? I'm assuming we know something about the, the frequency of having the disease and it's associated with the frequency of having that particular mutation. Yep. So if we know if we know that the, that a particular mutation, say it's the one thing, um, has a very high incidence of progressing to a disease, then that's the one we want to fight again. Okay. I'm Joe Schmo. My kid actually had one of those rare ones. I'm going to sue your pants off. I'm going to take my I'm taking the vacation to Bermuda because you guys uh, took there was a known rare mutation, or even. No, no, no. So right again, this is this is this is back to what I said in the Jose modification. If you come back negative, right? Um, so you go on. I see. Then you go back. I mean, it's so, but, but okay. Well, all I'm saying is that refinement is still going to cause most of the time you're going to end up doing all the, all the mutations. But, but the alternative is to just do all the mutations all the time. Well, what, what I'm telling you, First, what I'm telling you, a third of them are unique. What? A third of them are kind of unique. 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 Are, pri are private mutations. The so the short answer is, I believe the right answer is you got to sequence the whole thing. I mean, there's no value in preemptive screening, say, for instance. Like if some, it, it, it depends. If it's for a given patient around a specific problem, I don't think there's, it, that's a very different situation from I'm a public health authority and I want to screen the population, and or I want to screen the population and just detect people at risk for this. But if you're a doctor with a specific question, I'm duty bound to actually do maximum for you. And, and and consequently, um, right, period. I mean, it just it seems, and maybe I've misunderstood this, but it seems kind of counter to what the current practices were. Again, standard testing for things like, for what we have thrombosis. Like, uh, the first thing they did was they tested for the most common things, back to front line efficiency, I mean, all these different things, because it's like, well, if you've got that, then, you know, and what we, you know, what we want to do, then you don't, we don't need to continue uh, because we already know you had a big problem. So that that's sort of, I guess, the big basis behind my approach is if you if you feel like, you know, this this uh, Joe Schmo came in and said, well, if my kid has this thing, the the fastest, cheapest thing to do would be to test him for the most common. So you see, you can do that because the doctor can actually kind of protocol set and actually talk this through the patient. We're going for the most common ones. We're we're five two twelve we're five uh, one two genomics, and five one two genomics does not have a relationship with the patient, and we're duty bound. I mean, and the doctor doesn't understand genetics as we already established. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm trying to stick to 2004. If we, if there is a private mutation that that the patient subsequently finds, we're toast. Even if we don't then go back. Mm -hmm. When are we when are we going to go back? No one's going to come back to us. Well, we basically we're going to follow doctors' orders. If if they say we want, if, if they if they say if they say I want to look at congenital adrenal hyperplasia, I think we have to look at every gene known to be. A, a, we'll, we'll build them accordingly, of course. If they say um, I want to look at 21 hydroxylase gene, we have to sequence the whole darn gene. Now, if they specifically say I want to look at just a mutation, which they'll never tell us. I want a mutation in codon 32. We'll we'll do that genotyping. But if the doctor is a standard doctor 2004 and says, check 21 hydroxylase gene, we've got to sequence the whole thing. There, there is no choice. Otherwise, otherwise we're, we're, we're toast. So I think, uh, yes, so I think I, I, the only thing I missed from the slide is that uh, for epigenetic things like methylation, uh, we even think about doing that, but for certain diseases, like that involved in printing, for instance, you want to look at methylation. So, pre-fight checklist. What is this going to take to get our clinic up and running? Now we're a 5 through 12 clinic. Not, we're not the company anymore. 
So would you or a staff member be able to be in, so I took this from some uh, very good website. I can't remember. I wish I could tell you which one it was. But you know, what are the things that you need to do but in order, uh, before uh, going? Would you or a staff member be able to be an advocacy resource? Is the patient and when appropriate the family prepared for either a positive or a negative test result? Does the patient understand the medical, psychological, and social ramifications of the test? Do you have a referral list of appropriate specialists and or genetic counseling services to resolve any issues that cannot be handled in the office? And these are all things that we have to do as a clinic before we can even start ordering these tests. And the workflow is as follows. For a positive test, these are all the things we have to do. Now we're, pri we're a primary care practice. There's, and the, the interpretation of the positive result is different and as different if it's a diagnostic test, a predictive test, a carrier test, prenatal testing, or newborn screening. If it's a uh, positive test and it's diagnostic, it's clinical diagnosis confirmed. If it's predictive testing, it tells you you have increased risk. If it's carrier testing, it tells you that you're a carrier. If it's prenatal testing, it says that the fetus has a, a specific condition. And if it's newborn screening, it tells you the, the, uh, the newborn um, has a disease. And the, the follow-up includes all the things you could imagine. For negative tests, if it's a diagnostic test, the symptoms are unexplained. The likelihood, if it's for predictive testing, the likelihood of showing symptoms is decreased. If it's a carrier, it's high likely that you're not a carrier. If it's prenatal testing, if it, the fetus was symptomatic, then um, it's unexplained. If it's not symptomatic, the chance for the test condition is small. And newborn screening, screening, the newborn is not tested, is not expected to have the condition. And there's a whole bunch of follow-up that does or does not devolve from these different levels of use of the same darn test across these different clinical states. And thinking about uh, 512, 512 Genomics, our old company, if we didn't know which one of the situations were involved, we'd, we'd have to be, practice a very defensive corporate policy to make sure it was, we'd be in the maximal uh, informed state uh, for all uh, conditions. So can I send a sample for microarray testing? We heard so much about microarrays in this class. In the USA, the answer is yes for a research protocol. Um, this summer, you're going to be able to order at Harvard Medical School um, uh, genotyping with a resequencing array for cardiac myopathies and for hearing deficiencies. Um, uh, these are custom chips from Affymetrics. And uh, for, uh, certainly for um, research protocols, we're using them for expression as well. Can you do this for commercial testing? The answer is no. Roche Diagnostics. Uh, three months ago, tried to get approved through the expedited review of uh, the FDA, the um, um, P P450 um, chip, which has all the genes that are involved for me metabolizing um, toxins and drugs, and therefore it's a very good pharmacogenomic uh, screen, and they were blocked dead in their tracks by the FDA. So they have to, go, unless they can appeal it correctly, they will have to go through full bore, expensive uh, FDA approval. And why is this so? Why is this the case? I could give you a lot of different reasons, but the short answer is the FDA does not understand this technology, and does not know what to do with it. I was part of a, uh, a panel with the FDA about talking about it. They have just agreed right now with Big Pharma just on what is the data structure with which they can transfer results, let alone interpretation or analyses of the results. So, so they're restricting you, you, just because they don't understand it, even though it's not like unleashing a new drug on the population that they don't understand the side effects. I mean, this, this actually doesn't do anything other than maybe give a patient something to worry about. Like, Let me give you, a, make it very concrete. It, it gives you a, a result that the patient then has her ovaries and breasts move for. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what, what? what? It's a classic example that I've heard the bilateral. Yes. But it's, for, no, for no real reason. For no reason, but that's going to happen, that's, many things are going to happen like that. I mean, just going to the doctor, <laughs> I try to stay with the doctor as, as much as I can, which is probably a bad idea, uh, because you probably should get uh, routine care, but, um, if every time you expose yourself to even an investigative proce procedure for the wrong reason, they're likely to find, again, for the false positive reason, um, things that are incidental but are create huge costs and worry and morbidity. 
you know, diagnostic tests themselves can kill you. So let's say you're told they have a risk for this, and then you you have to, and then you get a a um, a um, clause copy. A tiny fraction, probably one in two hundred thousand people, get, suffer bad outcomes from from uh, that procedure. <laughs> yeah. Plus, they, you know, those are you know, those are paid in the you know what, and so. Um, it's not insignificant. So this is a, this is a problem. So the short answer is microarray testing, no. But there's nothing holy about the FDA. In the Netherlands, um, I don't know. Again, if it's it, this was uh, what I had heard last year around this time, and I don't know if it's happened. But they were claiming they were going into routine use of microarray for breast uh, breast uh, biopsy um, screening and evaluation. I have to do the research to figure out whether it's happened or not. And there's, of course, the issue of consent. And, it, and the short answer, as we'll get to uh, shortly, is that you have to do a fairly extensive consent process. However, if the patient is symptomatic, if they have a cancer, or have a heart attack, or they have dementia, they're actually symptomatic, it's a much more simple uh, consent process. The, all the consent issues that you've heard about in popular press are about pre-symptomatic testing. So why don't they just approve the, the pre-symptomatic testing with the caveat or the, you know, the, the non-high rule that you're just going to follow and observe the patient? Like, let's say that we used to be going to get a little lump or something and somebody dies, right? Right. Maybe share a story with you know, somebody who went and got that, yeah. found it, and turned out to be nothing, but then right. had a complication. Right. So rather than going in and cutting someone's head open, Right. Or, uh, uh, going colonoscopy or anything else. Just concern the, the patient. Six months, year, two years, three years. So let me tell you something about medicine. That's impossible. Um, if you find something that is looks bad um, on an MRI, because even if you're a ch if you believe that's only one chance in a hundred that it is truly a bad thing, and something bad happens to that patient. Not only are you toast with the legal system, but you'll feel terrible. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it can make you very, very fidgety to have uh, a patient with a finding that you were taught in medical school is badness. So until we completely, and so we're talking 2004, medical education 2004, we're taught that certain bumps on MRIs mean bad things. So if you start changing your priors by screening everybody, then bumps do mean different things, but that's not the way we've been educated, so we can get itchy as hell. So with the advent of new detection technologies for particular things, like new contrasting images that are specific for that, yeah. this sort of problem has paid for that. Yes, except it never really does because um, I don't, f well, that's not true. For certain things, we're going to get specific enough um, markers. You know, I can imagine that a bump Maybe wrongly, imagine a bump plus a functional assay, like with a PET scan, will show that this is a highly uh, rapidly dividing thingamajig, and therefore it's a problem, or it's totally quiescent, it's metabolically quiescent, and we can just observe it. So that's possible. Yes? Because, like, you know, I, I just listened to Judith Fulton talking about his idea of why don't we treat cancers before they actually do He's cancer. absolutely right. And, and that sort of, falls, to me, falls right in line with this just, you know, What's the harm in, in doing this analysis? But let's, let's, I, mean, I've, I've, you know, I have the greatest respect for Judah, and I'm sure he would agree with what I'm about to say. It all comes down to what is the treatment and, who, and what threshold do you pick? So if you're looking at a certain um, angiogenic signature, whether it's in a polymorphism or something that you're measuring, what's your false positive rate and how toxic is your treatment? If your tra treatment is totally benign, of course, treat everybody. And, and cheap, it's, and treat everybody. But that's almost never true. It's not never completely benign and completely cheap. So you end up having to make decisions. So now for pre-symptomatic, uh, asymptomatic predictive testing, consent is actually a very, very um, complex and drawn out process. So here's what, it's, what, it's, what is involved. Again, this is 2004. It may change to be more rigorous or less rigorous, depending on whether or not the, the Genetic Privacy Act, which is now 
somewhere in Congress will be enacted or not. So the current uh, state of the art is the major med medical facts including the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the way of the treatments uh, and the treatment of the disorder tested has been explained to the patients. The genetic facts involving including risks for other family members has to be explained. Uh, the chance that the test will give a correct prediction as well as indeterminate, indeterminate or unexpected findings has to be explained to them. The risk of receiving an unfavorable res test result and the possible consequences for yourself and your family. In the case of prenatal diagnosis, this may include the risk of facing a decision about abortion. And you have to tell them in a way that they really you know, recognize they understand. Some people are videotaping these consents now. Both to keep the people, not both to make sure, both defensively and also to make sure that the practitioners are doing the right thing. Alternate, you make, should be made clear that you can refuse the, the test. You give, you be uh, informed of potential benefits and disadvantages, including unset, unsettled questions of privacy protection dealing with insurances, banks, or employers. We don't know, you know, you might be able to say today the, um, uh, the insurance company is not going to do anything with it, but that test is now forever in your medical record. It may be not true five years from now that the, a different insurance company or the same insurance company will feel differently. Your care will not be jeopardized without every decision you and your family make. Possible use of your tissue sample after testing, they have to understand that, whether it's destroyed or kept for reanalysis, and whether it can be kept for uh, DNA banking. All these things have to be discussed with the patient. This is not a um, five minute discussion. And remember again, your typical, back to our, our uh, corporate clinic, uh, 512 clinics, um, our standard uh, visit for a patient is on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. And I'm telling you that this consent process requires an hour to do, to do it uh, adequately. Having said this, I want to tell you, we're actually performing routine, comprehensive genetic testing on our entire population. Did you know that? You bet. So we're, doing, we're testing all kids in, in the United States for a, genomic, a genetic disease like phenylketonuria. Uh, we're now looking for all the common polymorphisms of um, CFTR, the cystic fibrosis uh, responsible gene. And um, if you really look what the, what the Massachusetts State Laboratory is doing right now in uh, Worcester, they're uh, with the University of Massachusetts, I said. They're in Jamaica Plain, but they're affiliated with the University of Massachusetts. They're actually looking at maybe 10, 20 uh, diseases that they're going to do uh, risk factor screening for. Now, unlike our company, 512 Genomics, they really have to do, uh, come, come to a couple decisions about when to do this. How is it determined what is routinely screened? Three components, public health assessment, evaluation of tests and interventions, policy development, and screening implementation. Public assessment is fairly straightforward. Disease or condition should be an important public health burden, not a, not a rare bird. And what, is, what does that mean? That means typically they like to see it above 1 in 20,000. They won't admit to that, but it's, it's around there. Like thyroid disease, which was one of the first things to be screened, is about 1 in 5,000. Uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which they do screen for now, for 21 hydroxy, is about 1 in 20,000. The prevalence of the genetic trait, okay, has to be known. The natural history of the condition from susceptibility to latent disease to overt disease should be adequately understood. And basically, the safety and efficacy of the test, blah, 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 has to be known. Now, the policy issues are obviously important, but the main issue is this one. The cost of the effectiveness of the screening should be established. In other words, the screening procedure, whatever it is, whether it's genotyping or a tandem mess spec, has to actually be within the budget of the state of Massachusetts. And that's why, unlike uh, 512 Genomics, there are absolutely allowed to make decisions like we're only going to look for the uh, genotypes that account for 99% of the disease burden because it's a public health intervention and not our doctor. And that's very, very different. Most of those tests were biochemical, but they're testing a, a genetic disease. But what I'm telling you is the cystic fibrosis, this is actually old. The cystic fibrosis test now is a DNA test. And there's, they have now 20 tests that are going online. This is an old slide. OK, in the remaining 10 minutes, let's role play. Let me tell you about a disease. Congenital hyperinsulinism is the most frequent cause of severe, persistent hypoglycemia in newborn babies and children. 
In most countries, it occurs in approximately 1 in 25,000 to 1 in 50,000 births. About 60% of babies with hyperinsulinism develop hypoglycemia during their first month of life. Their blood sugar crashes. An additional 30% will be diagnosed later in the first year and the remainder after that. So 90% of them are just diagnosed in the first year, 60% in the first month. With early treatment and aggressive prevention of hypoglycemia, brain damage can be prevented. The brain damage is from having sustained low blood sugar, which is actually not harmful when you're an adult and your brain is um, stable. But when you have a developing brain and it's not uh, getting a lot of uh, glucose and therefore metabolism, for periods of time, especially repeatedly, you can really have brain damage. However, brain damage can occur in up to 50% of children with hyperinsulinism if their condition is not recognized or if treatment is ineffective in the prevention of hypoglycemia. On the other hand, so remember this, it, it's a one, 25, 1 in 25,000 and 1 in 50,000. On the other hand, neonatal hypoglycemia, so hypoglycemia in these newborn kids has an incidence of 2 to 5 per 1,000. There's a zillion reasons why kids um, have hypoglycemia, from being slightly immature at birth uh, to the IV was switched off too fast, and so all of a sudden the pancreas didn't have uh, an, enough minutes to wake up and switch off the uh, insulin, um, that uh, they're having an infection, and so on. So the, the state of our knowledge in 1992, when I was finishing my pediatric endocrine res residency, was there was a disease that there was this disease called mesoblastosis or hyperplasia of the pancreatic islet cells, the cells that produce insulin. And for reasons that we didn't know, either the entire pancreas or s spots in the pancreas were hyperproducing um, insulin. And uh, we, if we didn't uh, treat it, pro and some percentage of these kids would go on to be medically manageable. But a whole bunch of them were not. and would have to take out their whole pancreas. And sometimes we saw that we, shouldn't, we didn't need to take out the whole pancreas, that there were just uh, focal pieces of pancreas that were involved. We could have left them more. Because by taking the whole pancreas out, we made them A, diabetic, B, with the insufficiency of those enzymes that you use to dissolve your foods. It was really not a pretty sight. Plus, we kept them in the hospital for weeks to diagnose them. That was the state of art when I was a uh, fellow. So here's a state of our knowledge in 2004. There's something called a potassium channel, of which there are many, which controls insulin release in the islet cells. Basically, there are these two uh, proteins, SUR and um, KIR 6.2, which actually gate the flow of uh, potassium. The, rest, the channel determines the resting membrane potential, which is maintained at the necessary voltage to keep voltage-dependent calcium channels closed in the cell that does not secrete. When glucose comes into the cell, and there's a resulting change in the ratio of ATP from, uh, to ADP because of metabolism, K channels close and the membrane depolarizes. Subsequently, voltage-gated voltage -gated calcium channels are open, initiating the insulin secretory cascade. Therefore, the K channel flanks the potassium channel functions as a link between the metabolic state of the cell and the electrical activity of the membrane, resulting in the stimulation or inhibition of insulin release. So we have a thermostat, uh, a, re a rheostat, which says, essentially, the more, ins the more glucose I see, the more I'm going to uh, release calcium and, therefore, insulin into the blood. So it, that's the re basic rheostat. And we know that these two genes, which actually happen to be next to each other, on chromosome 11, if you have mutations in them, instead of coming nicely together in this um, octamer, they come in these various uh, dysfunctional or poorly functional uh, heterodimers or, or homo, uh, homo, homo octamers. They just come together in the wrong way, and they don't work right. And it turns out there's a lot of mutations in SUR, one of those genes, that in, this, in the uh, Cure uh, 6.2, there's only a th three known mut mutations, but there's looks like maybe uh, 30, 40 mutations in, in SUR. Some of them are common. They're hot spots. A lot of p different families have them. Some of them are one of a kind. Some of them are in the coding regions. These are the 39 um, exons of SUR. And by the way, that's really going to cost us in our uh, 512 genomics uh, uh, company to sequence all of those. And... Uh, some of them are in introns. They're at the 
um, the splice junction. They're just right inside, just right um, across the uh, intron exon boundary into the part of the intron, which is the donor or splice acceptor site, which determines when you're going to splice or not. And these all are known, highly penetrant causes of disease. They're autosomal recessive. They're autosomal recessive, but if you look at um, these two um, forms of hyperinsulinism, so th if you look at the slide, there's um, two patients that, that have the two different uh, presentations I told you about. One has these uh, focal, lo lob um, focal hyperplasia, which pushes aside the normal tissue, and the other where it's diffuse and it's throughout the tissue. And it turns out we now know why that is. It, it turns out that there is, in the, in the uh, diffuse form, it's germline transmission of the homozygous state. In the focal state, what's happening is there's loss of heterozygosity so that you have in a parental gene, I think actually specifically a paternal gene, and there's loss of heterozygosity to the loss of the maternal allele. And so in those um, cells with loss of maternal allele, you get focal hyperplasia due to the, um, the poor functioning of that uh, channel. So I've told you about this disease, and in the last five remaining minutes, would you order a genetic test? How about hypoglycemia in a newborn? Baby Jose says no. Dr. 512, um, are you going to order this test or not? At least he's playing like a doctor because he's actually making a decision because we have a patient. We need a decision. One in a thousand? What? You said one in a thousand. It's two to, it's, uh, I think I said two to five in a thousand of routine hypoglycemia. And I think I said one in 25,000 uh, for um, persistent hyperinsulinemia. Yes, no, what do we do? Doc, Dr. Wolf. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. So there are people like you who do it, but. Thankfully, we don't give them the opportunity because uh, because 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 512, 512 genomics would be incredibly happy with you because we'd be making a mint, but probably you want to look for more signs and symptoms to, to make you think that this is happening. Um, holy smokes! So my take on it would be if there's a persistent drop in glucose, if the IV runs. Um, I should say, uh, less, yeah, less than twice the basal means. Let me give you the full scenario. You have a kid that you're maintaining the blood sugar by giving twice the normal amount of glucose. And every time you try to wedge it, pull it down, the kid, the kid gets hypoglycemic. And it doesn't happen once. It happens many times over the first few days. And so basically convince yourself that there's something wrong. So you give yourself two or three days to really convince yourself that there's something wrong. And when you do that, well, I'm just telling you by experience, probably you want to do that within the first week. So what would you order? Sequen I mean, by the way, don't feel bad about this. If I asked this to any group of medical students or endocrine fellows, they would not know the answer. So which gene? Uh, the, uh, both. both, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Which part of the gene? Yeah. Remember our dark, uh, that picture of SUR? I thought we saw things everywhere, right? Yeah. From what sample? <laughs> you could, and eventually, if you know, three months out, if we have no better story, uh, but you know, parents are wailing on you, say. Presumably, it's so you should. No, but maybe it's not. So, I mean, I'm telling you that this uh, certain. Group, so, but you have these parents. Parent, these parents are wailing on you, and saying, and they're not. And you're saying three months. I say, I thought I came to Harvard. Uh, don't you guys have genetic testing? So what are you going to do? <laughs> you brute! So here's what I would do. Um, if we ever come certainly to, to um, pancreatic removal, which we will have to in some cases, definitely won't want to look at the, the mutation tissue. But what I'd do is I'd actually look at the, pa the parents and see if the father and mother also have uh, the mutation. So if the father, for instance, has the mutation, in one gene, is, is, if he's heterozygous for the mutation, um, I'm going to have a very high index of suspicion. Uh, if the baby is homozygous, obviously, so I look at baby blood, 
and look at uh, bad blood. And this is what I would do. But I just, when I'm pointing out it's not obvious, and every story is slightly different. And that's why this whole area of genomic medicine is incredibly fraught with a knowledge management problem. No, no such thing. Oh yeah. Right. Right. Um, why wouldn't you try to uh, build up a, uh, get a sufficient uh, uh, cell, some of the extract and RNA, and build up a CDNA you know, thing, and just basically test to see what's wrong with those guys? Okay. If let's let's go. Let's. Anything, are we looking at expression or are we looking at DNA? So those were those were point those are point mutations. Those are point mutations. Some of them were deletions. Some of them were deletions. But most of them, in fact, everyone I showed it was a micro deletion. Three or four bases gone. Every array I looked at that I showed you would would actually still say the gene was present. Right, but if it if it was in one of the it would say it's not, right? so that no, it just that just changes the splicing, or it would cause early termination of the gene product. But you still have, if, if let's say for the sake of argument, let's go back. Yeah. yeah. So for instance, let's say that it's here. So, and let's say that the fact that you have this, that this you're missing this G goes A that you don't in fact have the splice correctly and that leads to continued um, translation of the intron as an exon and therefore since it's mumbo jumbo it causes premature termination. You still have 90% of the gene there that's being transcribed and that RNA therefore is going to be registered by the expression array. Now you could say maybe exactly maybe I want to have a resequencing array that's just saying that's another. We still have to resequence. We still have to sequence, uh, resequence the gene. No way around that. Okay, where would you send it? Well, we know the answer. We'd look up gene tennis, gene clinics, gene test. What would you to tell the parents in your obtaining of the consent? Well, I, I'm running out of time, but I think in addition to the things that we said before, we actually have to tell them that. We might not find uh, the cause of it, but that if the father shows up one thing, that might be uh, one result, if, and therefore we may only have to hack out a bit of the pancreas. If the kid's homo homozygous for it, we may have to take out the whole pancreas and so on. So that's it for today. Um, that's really the state of the art of genomic medicine 2004.